Hello! Happy 2022. I hope you are enjoying um, 2022 so far more than you enjoyed 2021. Um, I feel like that is the best any of us can hope for um, <laughs> without um, kind of getting sucked into too much questioning of what's going to happen next, etc. So yeah, I'm going to leave that at that and move straight on to the point of this video which is to do my November and December 2022 wrap up. So I have quite a lot of books to cover in this video and I don't want it to go on for hours so I'm going to go through them all quite quickly which I think is fine because a lot of them are comics and graphic novels um, which I don't have all that much to say about because they're quite short and I also have read a couple of sequels which I don't want to talk about too much because of spoilers for the earlier books in the series um, so hopefully this won't go on for too long but we'll see, we'll see. So the first book I read in November was The King of Crows by Libra Bray, which is the fourth and final book in the Diviner series, which is possibly my favourite historical urban fantasy series of all time. I know that is quite a specific um, genre to describe, but it is, it is what it is. It is what it is. Because this is a sequel and the last in the series, no less, all I can really say about it is that I enjoyed it. Um, I'm kind of sad this series is over, but incredibly relieved to get to the end and find out that Libba Ray did not do what she did with the um, the end of the Gemma Doyle trilogy. Because if you've read the end of the Gemma Doyle trilogy, <laughs> you will know, um, yeah how controversial that ending was <laughs> and how there have been a lot of jokes about it over the years so yeah none of that here it's fine I really enjoyed it. Moving along swiftly we have lots and lots of comics so I went to the Fort Bubble um, convention and I bought uh, a few comics I posted a haul um, yesterday on the channel and um, I read some of those, but then I also uh, read some of the books that my partner, Nick Bryan, bought while he was there. Um, so here's a mixture of stuff that I bought and stuff that he bought. Um, so first up, Cat Disco. I talked about it quite a lot in my haul, so I'm not going to talk about it again here. It's basically about a cat that discovers that there is a secret cat disco for cats where they can go and socialise and do gross cat things and party and live the high life um, and how he kind of gets involved in all of this. This is perfect if you love the Studio Ghibli film, The Cat Returns. Um, it's definitely got those kind of vibes. Next I read Who Can Replace a Man, which is an adaptation of a short story by Brian Aldiss, um, drawn and adapted by Laura Callahan. Um, so this is a kind of sci-fi robot based story. Uh, here's a quick peek inside. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really interesting story and the adaptation was great. It was really thoughtful um, and meaningful and yeah, not much else to say about that. Then I read Purple Hate Balloon by Fraser Geeson and Laurie Rowan. Um, I think Nick had just read this, he was on the train home from Book Bubble at the time. Um, and I picked it up and I found it so funny. Um, it's basically about someone who gets this kind of like pet balloon thing which absorbs his um, anger and produces nice smells. It's very strange. Anyway, this um, is just very funny and leads to um, possible world destruction and I really enjoyed it. Then I read the most anticipated Fort Bubble new comic of them all, Cindy and Biscuit Year One. If you've watched my <laughs> YouTube channel before, you will know how much I love the Cindy and Biscuit series. It's basically what if Buffy was a small girl and her sidekick was a dog. So the main Cindy and Biscuit series is set when Cindy's at primary school. This goes back further in time um, and we meet Cindy when she's smaller and when Biscuit is a puppy. Um, it's a very very cute and funny and really short and very interesting format in this sort of like mini newspaper. 
really cool. That's the end of comics for now, there are more coming up in my December reviews. But next up in November I read Crazy in Love at the Lonely Hearts Bookshop by Annie Darling, which is the third in the Lonely Hearts Bookshop series. I listened to the audiobook of this. Um, it follows Nina, who is one of the shop assistants at the bookshop, who has a kind of reputation for always going for bad boys, but she decides that she's had enough. She's not going to have any more to do with bad boys. However, she is very, very reluctant to really go after the good ones. Um, and this kind of follows that and her kind of um, very slow build romance with um, a kind of business analyst who has come to the shop to look at how they do things and improve them. I really really like this, I think it's my favourite of the series, um, it's just lovely to get back to that world and the fantasy of a little bookshop um, and all the characters there. It was just really fun, really romantic and I loved it. Next up I listened to the audiobook of Surge by J Bernard, this is a poetry book. Um, I got to this point of the year and I looked at how far away I was from even hitting half of my Goodreads goal and I kind of panicked and I thought what can I, what can I do other than read more comics, um, which I was already doing, I decided I could listen to some poetry. This is something I had actually been wanting to do for ages so it wasn't fully motivated by wanting to improve my um, reading challenge total, uh, but that, I can't lie, that did, that did play into it somewhat. So I borrowed Serge from the library because I had heard some poetry by Jay Bernard before, back when I was a young creative writing student. Um, I used to keep meeting poets and um, Jay Bernard was one I met a couple of times. This was well over a decade ago so it's really nice to um, find that all of these people that I kind of went to poetry readings for when they were first starting out, have now got published books and are kind of doing well in their poetry careers, you know that was really exciting and I really enjoyed this book. I'm just going to read part of the description on my phone because I think that's the best way to describe it. Um, it says, Jay Bernard's powerful debut is a queer exploration of the black British archive, tracing a line between two significant events in recent British history, the New Cross Massacre of 1981 in which 13 young black people were killed in a house fire and the Grenfell Tower Fire in 2017. So the author did lots of, of research into both um, events and kind of the surrounding situation and um, that really comes across in the poetry which is also beautiful to listen to. It's read by the author so you get the kind of perfect rhythmic delivery which is really exciting and engaging and I really really enjoyed it. There's also a um, author's note um, which kind of explains the, the process and the stories behind the poems a bit more which is really really interesting. It's very thought-provoking and I would strongly recommend it. So that's November, moving on to December and we're very quickly back to a comic. Um, this is Lavender Clouds, comics about mental health and neurodivergence. Um, I really really enjoyed this, this was like this was like suddenly discovering like the bible of my brain and I kind of feel like I should buy copies of this for everybody I know and give it to them and be like okay this is how my brain works, just read this and you'll get it. <laughs> this isn't a narrative comic, this is more like um, mini comics about particular issues that keep coming up for the author and kind of how she navigates her way through life. So it would be quite easy to dip in and out of, a lot of it I believe is also available online, this is kind of a collection of the web comics, but I, it's just it's such a beautiful book. Um, I couldn't find it for sale on the author's website so it might just be something you can get at conventions, but ugh, look at these end papers, they're so nice and I just love the kind of pastel colourway of it. Even the darker pages have this really colourful undertone and it's just beautiful and I loved it. Next up for my workbook club I listened to the audiobook of How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House by Cherie Jones. Uh, this is a story set in Barbados, um, kind of in a very touristy spot, I think all of the action takes place on a beach um, and is about um, various characters who are involved in the death of a baby. It explores their relationships to each other, their backgrounds, and it's really thought-provoking. It's not the easiest to read, it's a bit harrowing in places, but it is very interesting to kind of see that darker side to um, what I think a lot of people in the West see as a 
nice tourist destination and they don't really know um, what else might be going on there. Um, it's very critical of people who go there for holiday or who go there to sort of have a summer home um, and how um, complacent they are, how they expect the police to look after them and that the police do to an extent look after them and care more about the tourists than the locals. So yeah, it's quite dark. The story is really, really gripping and I would recommend it. Next up, I decided to kick off my Christmas reading with The Twelve Dates of Christmas by Lisa Dickinson, which I listened to on audiobook. This was unfortunately not to my taste. It was a romance which was entirely focused on the romance um, and didn't have like a B plot or some other issues going on for the characters and that just didn't do it for me. Um, I like it when a romance also covers some kind of family issues or something else that's going on in the character's life um, and this just didn't. I think a lot of people w would enjoy it because it is just kind of focused on the romance but it wasn't for me. It's about a woman who breaks up with her boyfriend right before Christmas and ends up going on a whole bunch of dates. Um, and yeah, <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it. Next up, I finally got around to finishing Gideon the Ninth, which I think I started at the tail end of November, optimistically meaning to include it as a Halloween read. No, didn't happen, didn't happen. Um, I loved this. <laughs> Um, I think it took me quite a while to read it just because I had so much going on in my life. Um, I didn't have the time to sit down and properly get into it like I wanted to. Um, this was the kind of book where I started reading it and I was like, okay, I want to read this in long sittings, not in little short bursts. I want to really, really be able to absorb myself and swell. There's so many characters. Um, there's a, uh, a list of who they all are at the start of the book, which I was referring to constantly. I don't think I preferred to a list of characters so much ever whilst reading a book. Um, it is not like a confusing amount of characters it's just that they have such um specific roles and names i had to kind of remind myself who they all were in relation to each other um but yeah this is basically um a uh a weird sci-fi fantasy locked room mystery with a very um idiosyncratic narrative style um that's very funny and delightful. Um, it's also about friendship um, and friendship forged in very very strange circumstances. Um, so basically the main character Gideon um, is a uh, kind of like a, a ward of this, um, a ward and a servant of this kind of aristocratic house of necromancers who kind of worship death. It's all very strange. Um, <laughs> And suddenly her life is changed um, when her latest foiled escape plan leads to the revelation that um, the, kind of the mistress of this house, the heir to um, this whole situation, um, has been summoned by the emperor um, to appear on this other planet. So they go off to this other planet together um, because the um harrow the um the air needs a um a cavalier basically like a fighter a swords person um to assist her and the official swords person is not very good and wimps out of the whole thing um so gideon ends up taking his place and there's this whole deal where she'll get rewarded for it in the end but um they go off to this place and then they get um kind of stuck in to this strange world with lots of mysteries going on and then um some murders start happening which they have to investigate whilst also trying not to get murdered themselves not knowing who they will trust um it's kind of got this weird decadent gross faded glamour wealth privilege thing going on but also like it's just bizarre. It's really bizarre and I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm looking forward to reading the sequel. Um, I am going to request it from the library as soon as I have space on my holds because I have all my holds maxed out at the moment. There's just so many books I want to read <laughs> and I'm not reading them fast enough to open up new holds. Or I guess I just need to slow down the holds. Yeah. Mm. 
Mm, that might be it. I've really let myself have free reign with the library lately, and it's been great. Um, but it has increased my TBR drastically. <laughs> Next up, I read A Winter Kiss on Rochester Muse, which is the uh, last in the Lonely Hearts bookshop series by Annie Darling. This follows Matty, who runs the cafe at the bookshop, um, and her blossoming romance with Tom, who is the kind of grumpy man bookseller who we haven't learned that much about in the previous books. Um, they do not like each other, and this gets worse after they end up fighting over one room in the flat above the bookshop because they both want it to be convenient for work. Personally I think Matty has the better claim, seeing as she has to get up super early, but your mileage may vary. Um, anyway, they fight over this, they fight over a whole bunch of other things. There's some trauma involving awful ex-boyfriends, and yeah, yeah. It's a good time. I really enjoyed it. It's set at Christmas, but both Matty and Tom are Christmas haters. Um, so if you are not a Christmas person, you may still enjoy this. You may empathise with their grumpiness. If you are a Christmas person, don't worry. There's still lots of festive fun. Um, I think it was just great. And if you like romance, you need to check out this series because it's adorable. It's just really cute and complete escapism. It has really got me through the last couple of months. And I just, yeah, I need to find more like this. <laughs> Next up, I listened to The Christmas Pact um, by Vry Keelan and Penelope Ward. Just having to remind myself because this was a audible short um, it was a novella that I listened to with an audio, audio audible free trial. I can say, I can, I can say words. Yes, um, yeah. Um, this is basically uh, fake dating. Um, uh, co colleagues who share a name end up agreeing to pretend to be each other's date for various reasons. Uh, she wants to impress her mother and make her proud. He wants to uh, have a date for his brother's wedding for various reasons. Um, and they end up doing each other this favour and of course feelings develop. I didn't find the premise to be the most believable, but the execution was a lot of fun. Next up, I listened to The Kindness Method by Sharu Izadi, um, which is a book about changing habits through the power of kindness. Um, the description says that this is equally about um, installing good habits as tackling bad habits, um, but the author's background is in addiction and um, kind of overcoming compulsive behaviours and that kind of thing. So you may find it more useful for bad habits than for good habits. Personally, um, there are some interesting ideas in this and there's some stuff that I'll kind of take away. The author's process is basically to create a series of maps to tackle different issues that may be holding you back from achieving your goals and tackling these bad habits. Um, and some of this, um, I think, will be useful stuff that I'll take away and use, um, but a lot of it just didn't feel relevant to me. Next up I listened to There's Something About Mary, which is another Audible original, this one a full length novel. Um, I listened to during a free trial. Um, so right now looking at the Goodreads description, I am realising that the character is actually called Mary. Uh, I think this is an American British thing like accent differences thing. Honestly, from the way they pronounced it throughout the book, I thought she was called Mary and I was a bit confused by the title because I was like, why didn't they not just call her Mary if it's supposed to be there's something about Mary? But yeah, I think that's the accent. It just, I just, yeah. So yeah, I'm shocked to learn that the protagonist was actually called Mary. <laughs> um, so this is actually the second in a series. Um, I didn't listen to the first one because the, um, a synopsis didn't appeal to me so much, and I don't think I'll go back and listen to it. I did enjoy it, I just found it to be very long. Like, I think it would have been better as a novella rather than a novel, because there wasn't kind of enough kind of substantial other stuff other than the romance to keep it going so long, if that makes sense. Like, just my personal preference. Like, I think some people will revel in that, but for me, it just seemed a bit drawn out. So it's about a woman who is struggling to find 
um, any romantic prospects. Uh, she lives in a small town near her family's Christmas tree farm. And this is another, this is a theme that comes up a lot in, in Christmas romances, uh, Christmas tree farms. Um, and uh, she wants to take over the farm one day, but her father um, doesn't seem keen on it. And she's jealous of the new foreman he's hired. Um, meanwhile, the foreman um, is a single dad. Um, he is also kind of lonely and wants to meet someone and they both end up going on a dating app and unbeknowingly getting to know each other through there. And it kind of goes on from there with them first starting to talk on the app, realising who they are, going on various dates and it's, it's very nice and it's festive. Um, but unfortunately I read another book set on a Christmas tree farm which I enjoyed a lot more so I think it kind of suffered by comparison in the end um, but I did enjoy it and it was fun it was very cute. After that I listened to Christmas at the Comfort Food Cafe which I got from the library. Oh my god I loved this so much. I It just really showed what a good Christmas book can be. Um, so unusually for a um, Christmas romance uh, family drama life kind of book um it was in the first person um and the narrator captured my attention immediately so this is about a woman called becca who hates christmas but she's going to stay with her sister and her family who love christmas um so she's decided to put a brave face on it but when she gets there she ends up falling in love with the location um, her sister sorted out for her to stay in a room above the comfort food cafe um, and she meets lots of people and gets to know them and they sort of kind of bring her out of her shell and get her to talk more about her feelings and of course there's a handsome man that she falls in love with and it was just delicious i think appropriately for a book centered around a cafe um i just loved it and i enjoyed it so much I definitely will be looking at the other books in this series. I feel like maybe I won't read the first one, um, this was the second, uh, because so much of what happened in the first one was talked about in this one, uh, but there is another Christmas book that I've already requested from the library um, and there's some others as well which are not set at Christmas that I'm looking forward to listening to or reading however I can get my hands on them. Next up I listened to another Audible original novella um, and that was Hold Me Closer, Tony Danzig. Um, so this is a, a very karaoke bar <laughs> uh, set romance about a woman who is a karaoke DJ um, when another woman comes up, sings a song to her ex and immediately they are drawn to each other. But the ex wants to get in the way. Will they sort it out? Will they fall in love? Will everything work out? There's also some added complication because it turns out that they're all working on a business project together and their families get involved and there's rules which are broken and bent and um, completely ignored. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, I enjoyed it. Next up is Underneath the Christmas Tree by Heidi Swain which, no prizes for guessing, is the other Christmas tree farm romance that I was alluding to earlier. I really, really enjoyed this. It's about a woman who um, is the co-heir to a Christmas tree farm and um, she wants to sell it. She wants to start her own business. She doesn't want anything to do with it after her dad died, tragically. It was her father's dream to open this place and run it, but unfortunately he died when she was still quite young and she has resented the place ever since. So she wants to see the back of it. Um, but she doesn't want to see it completely destroyed, she wants to see that it goes to good hands. So she sets off to visit the farm, hoping to, s to sell her share to the co current co-owner's son um, so that she can be free. But of course things get complicated, he was not expecting this at all, he needs some time to raise the money and she gets roped into helping out on the farm um, because of course she doesn't want to see it just destroyed, uh, you know it was her dad's work, she doesn't want anything to do it anymore but she wants to keep going um, and of course she ends up getting drawn in, um, she tries very very hard to not have a romance with the other owner's son um, but it happens. <laughs> it happens and it's really really nice. It's really cute. This was another one with a first person narrator which I think worked really well and yeah I loved it. I haven't read any other Heidi Swain books before but I know she's really popular so I would definitely be checking them out. 
Next up, I listened to the Christmas podcast. Yeah, podcast as in poor animal poor. The cast uh, <laughs> uh, by Emily March. This is so cute, so cute. Like, if you think Christmas books are sugary sweet, this is like the um, icing piled cupcake on the top of the pile. This was just so cute. Um, so this is about a woman who is driving a heavily pregnant dog um, off to her family for Christmas um, when she gets caught in a snowstorm and she ends up having to take refuge with this man who lives on his own. He's very grumpy, he hates Christmas, he runs a true crime podcast. Turns out that she's heard this true crime podcast um, and yeah she ends up stuck there for several days. She starts Christmasifying the place because she loves Christmas and she just can't help it and he ends up confessing to her that the reason he hates Christmas is all to do with his son who isn't going to be there for Christmas he's off with his mother and yeah it's just it's so cute it's just adorable um perfect it's perfect escapism if you want something short um, and sweet to listen to Next up, I read the short story collection Christmas at Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. I had actually started this before. Um, I think I started it last year, but I only read one story and then I stopped. I think I ran out of time to do Christmas reading. Um, so I thought I just, I just wait till this, till this year. Um, this was unfortunately a disappointment. I really loved Stella Gibbons novels that I've read so far. Um, and I don't know, there was just something really basic about a lot of these stories. A lot of them seem to follow the same plot line. Now there were some that were good, I enjoyed the Cold Comfort Farm set story, I also enjoyed the first story which is set at Christmas, um, and there were a few others throughout the collection which I did find thought-provoking, interesting, enjoyable. However, they were an awful, awful lot of stories about a woman who is middle class um, and ends up resolving to be more stereotypically middle class so you know she's a career woman um but by the end of the story she decides that what she really wants is a nice man to move to the countryside and have babies um and this just keeps happening and it's really irritating and it like doesn't exactly ring true for other books that i've read by stella gibbons i have a theory that this keeps coming up because she was writing to market I think most, if not all, of these stories were originally published in various women's magazines, um, and so she would have been writing stuff that the um, publishers would have approved of. So there isn't a lot of room for nuance, um, the simplicity of the plot lines and of the emotional resolutions um, is probably because they're quite short and they were only going to um, have a very limited number of pages. Um, and yeah, I think that yeah, they were basically written for an audience and for a publisher um, that had this very particular view. As I say, it just doesn't really make sense for me, considering the subtlety and the variation in the women characters in her novels. Um, so yeah, very strange. It also has a very strange introduction by Alexander McCall Smith, which when I read it, I was like, why are you so down on her short stories? It's a very weird introduction for a book because it's quite, it's quite negative about the stories and I found this a bit alarming but then when I finished reading them I was like oh, okay he was right <laughs> he was right they are very definitely this way it's a very odd collection and finally in my particularly Christmas reading for now because of course it's January I'm still reading Christmas books there's still time I can do it um I've got so many books out the library I can't even tell you <laughs> But anyway, last year my December Christmas reading was One Christmas Kiss in Notting Hill by Mandy Bagger. Um, this is the third Mandy Bagger book I've read. Um, oh, I started on hers the year before last. I think I read One Christmas Star in 2019. And then in 2020, I read... Um, oh, oh, what was the title? It's set in Paris. Is it in here? Let's find out. Oh no, this is, this turns out is a very early Mandy Bagot book, which makes sense, um, because I didn't enjoy it as much as the other two. I did really enjoy it, um, but I thought that, um, it wasn't as subtle and it wasn't as funny and it just wasn't as good as the previous two Mandy Bagot Christmas books that I had read, um, which now makes sense, realising that this is one of her earlier ones. This is only her second book, um, judging by the book list in the front, it says, um, 
also by Mandy Bagger, Single for the Summer. I did still really enjoy it, it just wasn't as good as those other two later books that I read. Um, Mandy Bagger is definitely still one of my favourite authors, um, but yeah, I will be reading the rest of her books with great interest. Um, so one Christmas Kiss in Notting Hill is about Isla, um, who is a property developer. She works for this big international company, um, and when she's not doing that, she's looking after her sister Hannah, who is in her um, early 20s, I believe, but has been disabled since the accident which killed their parents. Um, so she very, feels very responsible for Hannah, and Hannah, meanwhile, is trying to gain more independence from Isla, and there's this really interesting conflict in their relationship there. Um, where Isla feels very, very responsible for Hannah, but Hannah wants her to loosen up a bit, although she accepts that there are things that she can't do by herself. Meanwhile, Isla is very much a career woman. She um, kind of fell into this job, but she's really great at it, and she's keen to grow in seniority and have more and more influence within the company. Then arrives from America, Chase Bryan who is a uh, former sportsman and motivational speaker who has now moved into running companies. Um, he has all of this business coach speak, which he uses on other people and himself, and he has two daughters in tow, um, who are very grumpy, who are not very pleased about being in London. His youngest daughter is slightly more enthusiastic. His older teenage daughter is a nightmare. Um, and when he arrives in London, Isla gets told that she has to be his go-to girl, um, and he thinks that this means that he can get her to help look after his kids. She's not very keen on this because she feels like she's being made into a kind of assistant, um, and lots of tension ensues, especially when it transpires that the company may be aiming, thanks to Chase, to redevelop the part of Notting Hill in which Isla lives. Um, so yeah, full of tension, full of drama, brilliant. <laughs> as I say, even though I didn't love it quite as much as I loved the other Mandy Bagger books that I've read, it's still a corker of a Christmas read. Next up, I read one of my Christmas presents. This is super exciting because I had forgotten it existed, didn't ask for it, and Nick managed to buy it for me anyway well done. Um, and that is Whistle, um, which is a uh, kind of like a uh, superhero comic about a new superhero created by um, E. Lockhart. Um, it's illustrated by Manuel Pretano. And um, the colours, interestingly enough, are by uh, Gabby Metzler, who has worked on one of Nick's comics. So random connection there. Um, I loved this so much. It's delightful. Um, it's about a girl who um, has a lot going on in her life. Her mother has cancer. She's very, very ill. Um, she's also involved in local politics and activism to help um, save their neighbourhood. I mean, they're in Gotham City. It's a lost cause, but she's trying, right? She's struggling to cope with the late nights and the long hours when to her rescue comes her mother's long lost friend, Enigma, who offers her a job helping to run his very illegal poker nights. Um, this solves all her problems. She has loads of money. She has new clothes. Um, but then she ends up finding herself in hot water with various supervillains. <laughs> there are some kind of interesting new takes on um, various supervillains who you might recognise from Batman. Um, there is also an adorable dog. Um, and I don't really want to say more than that because it's a graphic novel length book. It's, you know, there's not that much to it. I can easily spoil the fun, so I won't. I'm gonna leave it there and just say that I loved it. Five star, five star read. Made it into my top books of the year. Great. <laughs> Around this same sort of time, I finished listening to another audiobook, which is a holiday audiobook, but not a Christmas one. It's actually a Hanukkah story called Eight Winter Nights, um, and it's a romance, um, and it sets uh, kind of during a Hanukkah period that coincides with Christmas. Um, this is noted on in the story, so there is kind of the similar kind of Christmassy vibes to it, and there's parties, um, but basically it's about a woman who goes to stay with her best friend's ex-boyfriend, um, who she saw first and has had a huge thing for um, the whole time that they've been together, uh, basically to look after him because he had an accident, he hurt his leg, um, and her friend just like run off. <laughs> she basically 
broke up with him with very little warning and she's gone off on holiday and said can you look after him and she's like oh god um you know she feels like she has to go and help look after him uh, but at the same time she still has all these feelings for him um and it's basically about how their romance develops, there's some more parties, there's uh, uh, kind of like some bonding over Hanukkah celebrations because um, he goes along to her family celebration, which is interesting. I really enjoyed it and it was really interesting to read a book set around the Christmassy time of year that wasn't Christmas focused, that um, actually explored uh, a different religion and all the culture around that. So yeah, I really enjoyed that. Eight Winter Nights is another Audible original novella by Liz Maverick. Next up, I read The Garden um, by Sean Michael Wilson and Fumio Obata. Um, this is a very kind of slow, mindful story about um, a character who's um, burnt out from work. She's been signed off sick from stress and she discovers gardening. She goes to Japan to learn um, how they make traditional Japanese gardens because she wants to create this at home. Um, and yeah, it's a kind of... It's a very slow meditative read, there's not really like a big plot or a driving force or a major revelation, it's very sudden, it's just kind of a nice gentle read that I think I'll go back to and look at again and again. I bought that one at Fort Bubble along with The Cats That Stared by Claire Hubbard which is a very very short little comic um, about some cats who appear one day in a small town and stare at people and weird them out and it's yeah it's just cute. It's very, very cute and fun. Um, you don't really get the answer to the question of where the cats came from or why they do this staring, but it's adorable. Yay. <laughs> then my final print thing of the year was Golf Girl by Christopher Hazeldine. Um, this is a really silly, funny um, take on superheroes. It's about a girl who works at a golf course um, which she kind of hates and hates even more when these weird little alien creatures appear and give her and her friends and enemies powers related to their job. So she becomes golf girl um, who just mainly can hit golf balls really well. It's not a particularly useful power. Some people she knows have more substantial powers um, but yeah this is um, the first half of the comic so there's no ending in this book. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next, but it's funny, it's cute, um, the art style is delightful, and I would recommend it. Then finally, my last read of the year was digital, but also comics. Um, I read The Final Girls, uh, which is a comicsology original, which I think I got um, through Prime Reading. Um, so this is basically um, a story, um, I think it's like a five part series, um, yeah, yeah, it's a five part series, but I read it as the collected edition. It's about a group of retired or semi retired, um, superhero women who, um, basically all came from Scotland and have gone back to live in Scotland. Um, and they kind of like all hang out with this bar together. Um, but things get weird and their friendship gets damaged um, when um, some of them decide to go and beat up um, one of them's husband because he assaulted um, their friend, one of them. Um, and it kind of delves into um, why being a superhero wouldn't be very great, um, the expectations on them, um, the media and the conclusions that people jump to, um, how um, expectations of women in the public eye are and that kind of thing as well as feminism and um, believing people and listening to people and checking before you go on a murderous rampage um, <laughs> or even just telling some somebody something that you suspect about them um, you know like actually checking out the facts that kind of thing I really enjoyed this um, it's I kind of when I finished I felt it was a shame that there wasn't more of it because I think characters are just fabulous um, it's, a, it's a diverse cast um, and they all have kind of different powers as well some of them are more kind of physical and fighty than others um, kind of the main one um, has the ability to absorb other people's emotions um, and kind of 
see where those emotions came from so she can basically kind of read people's minds but also it has the negative effect of her having to carry people other people's emotions for them um which yeah <laughs> you can imagine has some quite problematic outcomes um and i think it kind of is a um I guess not very subtle, um, but a metaphor for emotional labour um, and the burdens that we can put onto other people or be um, be forced to bear um, by other people ourselves. Um, yeah, it's a really, really interesting series and I would recommend it. So there we go. That is my final wrap up for 2021. Thank you very much for watching. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you'd like to see more from me. And if you would like to read my free novella, Unlocking Lockdown, you can find the link to that in the description. If you've resolved to read more books in 2022, check out my free e-course, Ignite Your Passion for Reading, Fall in Love with Books, which is also linked in the description box below. You'll see me again soon. Bye!